God of Soul. This is Bass Talk Live. Your host, Mark Jeffries and Matt Pangrak. BTL is brought to you by Lawrence. Lose. Strike King Lures. Bass Cat Boats. Ducket Fishing. Spro. AFCO. Big Buy Bates. Sunline. And TH Marine. BTL coming at you. Good Tuesday, everybody. Welcome once again to another edition of BTL Bass Talk Live, where we're going to talk bass fishing and anything else that we want to talk about. It is a freezing, freezing day in Oklahoma today, Matthew. A lot of snow on the ground. And more coming. Is there more coming? Yeah, tonight. Okay. Like, they're calling, I don't know, two to four inches. Yeah. But it, it is. a treacherous drive into, into the studio yesterday. Was it bad? It would have, but I didn't drive in. Oh, yesterday, yeah. Because you were <laughs> ever. I'm sure the burning question on everyone's mind is how did uh, the, how did the uh, basketball uh, tournament good. go? Not good. Here, and I'm going to make this statement. We'll talk a little basketball and compare it to bass fishing. All right, the situation with our younger players right now. We are dealing with a situation of we have a lot of really good athletes that are playing basketball. All right. Okay. But the team that we were going up against is a bunch of kids that are basketball players that know how to play basketball. Do you see the difference? In other words, there's a lot of people that think that they can go out and catch fish because they might be able to cast well. They might be able to, I don't know, tie a knot well. They might be able to drive a boat well. But they're just not at the level to be able to go out, put a pattern together, and you know, perform. They're, they're very athletic, but the fundamentals are not ingrained they're just, in them to the point where they're making mistakes or out of position. Yeah, they just don't know the game yet. Well, that's and, what you're teaching them, right? That's the beauty of it. But you have other schools that have a massive advantage because the level that they are playing the game at, you're puts teaching us way things behind. that they're taking for granted. That they already know. Yeah, that they're taking for granted. Yeah. Like things that they you just do. It, 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 they weren't more physical than us. They weren't a tall team. They were just a well-oiled machine that knew you know, how to trap, that knew how to set ball screens. They're a team that goes that, out and cashes a check when they're not on the juice. That's a great way of putting it. So uh, lost by 11. We were actually down by 20. Came back, cut it to... What do we cut it to? Nine. That's a ball game. That's a three possession yeah, game. And then ended up losing by eleven. So uh I don't know if we play tonight. Varsity is supposed to play tonight, but with the coming snowstorm, who knows if we'll play tonight, but we'll see. Sure, it'll right. be a dusting, folks. Uh yeah, it, you know. It'll be a light they, dusting. They like hyping up the weather here in Oklahoma. We've talked you about like that. You like hyping up the weather. I do. Here in I, I I I love cold weather. I love snow. But dude, when the wind blows, that puts it in a different category. I think they have a song about that, don't they? I couldn't tell you. What is that? Where the wind comes sweeping down the <laughs> plains? Is that Oklahoma? Isn't that Boomer Sooner or Oklahoma? Yeah. Or, uh, yeah. When the wind blows and it's 28 degrees, it's a totally different category. All right, folks, uh, good shows this week. We're going to have two shows this week. And then next week, big announcement. Uh, we will only have one show next week. And we will let you guys know what's going on in 2021. A lot of stuff going on in 2021. And we will talk about that whole situation next Wednesday with our Christmas show. And then we'll follow up the week in between Christmas and New Year's with uh, a couple of shows there, wrap up the year, and then move, move on to 2021. But today, a very interesting show because there's been so much discussion about electronics. It has been. It's not something that's just suddenly blowing up. This discussion about electronics has been taking place for a number of years now. Uh, unless you have been under a rock and you are a, a, a weekend guy, a tournament guy, maybe a retired person that loves going out, catching fish, utilizing the technology that's available, 
Uh, the live scope technology from Garmin has changed the game. Forward, forward facing sonar. Because now that yeah. there's multiple players in the game, it is now, you now have to refer to it like you do a bladed jig. You're dead on. Okay. And the reason is, is because now Lawrence has stepped up their game. And Lawrence has their new product called Active Target. And we're going to have the guy on, Jeremiah Clark from Lawrence. The guy knows more about Active Target than probably any human on this planet. He's the product director for Lawrence. I mean, it, it, this is his life, Active Target. This is what he does. Mm -hmm. Seriously, they have been working on this forever. Now, as with everything, and Matthew, I want you to, to possibly come up with an example on this. Typically, when you're first to the game, right, your product, your service, your whatever, is not the greatest, but it's pretty doggone good. But you also have some allowance because they're not comparing it to anything else. All right. And you also make some, let's say, calculated mistakes, errors, improvements that could be have made. Yeah, the very could first generation of anything is yeah. typically that's if it was the best, there wouldn't be the right. second and third and fourth. So, and fifth so typically, though. when you're the the second to the show, the third to the show, you're actually learning from the way and and the uh, way that the product or service was was developed and actually implemented to the consumer, to the athlete, to whoever. Okay, I'm with Tori, you. you can actually learn from that first wave using using the uh, others as a, uh, over less of a better term a guinea pig as a sort well Looking kind of a at, test study. a testing stu test yeah study. yeah not a guinea pig that was oh, a wow. long time ago man is that <laughs> politically yeah. incorrect yeah now? guinea pigs no guinea pig was a long time ago did anyway. they actually use guinea pigs yeah lab so rats like, well they still do that yeah but why guinea pig they're so I don't cute know. I think because their immune system and some of the things about a guinea pig is very similar to a human. I'm Googling that. Have at it. All right. So now you have Lawrence that is stepping up to the place. And, and, and here, but it, this is what I told Jeremiah. I go, look, dude. You knew that. I said, the floor is yours. This is your opportunity to tell the people, not us, all right, because I haven't seen it yet. Now, I have talked to a few guys that have used it, that have seen and used both. And they said it, it, it's incredible. But I don't know. I, I cannot say that because I have not been on the water. I have not seen it in action. So we're going to let Jeremiah show you and tell you why that this particular product is at the level that it is. And it, it's this much better than LiveScope. So we had, was it two years ago at ICAST? That was Trolling Motor Wars. Now we're in forward-facing sonar wars. Yeah. Yeah. Because they yeah. had the... No, the, you're right. I, I've not been in when's the When's Humminbird going to come out with something? I, I mean, I keep hearing. Soon? I keep hearing. Very, Very soon? Interesting. And there's obviously a lot of interest in this topic. Now, you have to understand the average weekend guy I i'm gonna equate it to a new bowling ball technology that most of the time you all go bowl and not know anything about it yeah. and then you reach a certain level and then all of a sudden it becomes applicable i realize mm -hmm. it's applicable for everybody i might bowl better with a certain core whatever what is that called in the middle of the bowling ball that they put weight block weight block yeah. but i don't really know or care about it no i'm not going to spend 500 dollars on a weight block but then all of a sudden <laughs> you reach the point where you're like ah that weight block matters that's the same thing that we are in this yeah so it's a what i'm saying is this kind of shows how intense the interest is in this. Yeah. You have a small group of, of hardcore anglers that, that, that care about, regardless of what the technology is, whether you want to go talons, power poles, raptors, any of that stuff. But if you look at the views on the recent YouTube videos that have been published by uh, Independent, by Lowrance, by Lowrance Pros, by uh, marine companies that are selling mm -hmm. both of them, Dude, this thing is through the roof. Yeah. People are paying attention to it. They're watching the videos. I mean, it's, and the videos are out like a week and they got 20, 30, 40, 50,000 views on them. Yeah. So people are interested in this. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Look, people, look, the guy works for Lawrence. I get it. But at the same time, he has to explain why this product is better. 
All right. <laughs> he has spent the vast majority of the last, I don't know how long, two, three, four years, whatever it is, just specifically working on this project. I think he knows what the heck he's talking about. I feel, and this is just in my mind, but I feel at both Garmin and Lorance headquarters, like when you get into like the inner sanctum of the offices and where all this is going down, it's like three key fobs, a fingerprint, an eye scan. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Like it's top, top secret stuff in yeah. both of them. Yeah. All right, so uh, Jeremiah Clark will be on here just in a few minutes. And then uh, tomorrow, you know, dude, I, I, I remember so many interviews that we've done with Duckett. Uh, we've done a couple of interviews with John Acosta, who we're going to interview tomorrow. And, and one of the things that sticks in my, bra my brain is that it went from this is not a competition into this is a competition. Okay. All right, so I thought it would be a good idea because last week I had uh, Bill uh, Wanger on. Good interview. I went and went back and listened to yeah. that interview. He's a he's a very tough interview to get. There's a lot of inf a lot of information on that. I mean, he's a he's he put the Fox deal together with the NFL. I'm trying to think. Is he <laughs> the biggest interview that you've ever Probably. pulled on BTL in the history of the show? Probably. I mean, we've had some big time execs on. No, he was probably. But I mean, the, this guy, the man. If you Google him, yeah, he's big time, big time, and did great too. Corner so. office. Anyway, uh, big corner office. <laughs> big corner office. Yeah, big corner office. He could just probably pick whatever office he wants. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, uh, the competition is fierce, mm -hmm. and the information that Bill conveyed, and really all the information that we've been able to gather about the Fox deal, the live streaming the cross promotion that's going to take place with the other assets that Fox sports has. Uh, this is a big, big deal. And has the dynamic changed to where live, including live television has become more important than the initial way that major league fishing has deployed their asset, which is in a, package on, production like it was yeah. on cbs my dad actually called and he's like hey well, was, i was gonna was really i was cool. gonna get into that it was really cool yeah they t promoted it beforehand they gave the what do you call it a preamp a preamp yeah, and yeah. then boom it was on cbs in prime time yeah yeah and he wasn't expecting it he wasn't looking for it he literally just had that on it was heavy hitters yeah so we'll get into that because i wanted to know did you watch it and I DVR'd it. I watched it a little bit, but I'm going to go back and, and finish watching it tonight, and then we'll talk about it before we have John on tomorrow. Anyway, back to the point that I was trying to make. It, it is a massively competitive environment. And will John acknowledge that? That's one of my, one of my questions, because Boyd has acknowledged on this show that, yes, they are in a competitive environment. How important is live television now and has the dynamic changed of the way that their asset needs to be distributed to the fans maybe not they may say you know what we're gonna we're gonna be status quo we're gonna continue doing what we're doing the sponsors are happy it worked the anglers are happy there's no need to change and you can watch it live if you want to log on to mlf and they offered all sorts of new packages that yeah. if you want to even get more in live in depth Maybe they're, they're referring back to, well, now we're not in a competitive environment anymore. They're doing their thing. We're doing our thing. And you know what, folks? You either like it or you don't. You can either watch it or you don't. Yep. It, 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 we can talk more easy. about this later because I've talked to some, <laughs> some very – I've talked to, to touring pros on the BPT, on the Elite Series. There is a very, very wide range of thought process on this on – how impactful the live TV will. I mean, you talk to some and they say it's the deal. It's what we've been working for. It's yeah. bigger than you can actually express for yeah. sponsors. For the You talk to others who say, hey, the people that are going to watch this want to see fish catching, and it's actually going to turn them off to the sport when they watch live and no one catches a fish for 30 minutes. So it's more impactful to have a pre-production package that is on it to where whenever you turn it on, if they watch it for three minutes, they might get hooked because they see a big fish getting caught, and the live is actually going to be boring for these people, and they're going to find other programming. So Dude, that's I people who make their living fishing yeah. that are 100% convinced that it's not a big deal, 
and those, and they're on both sides. Mm -hmm. There's guys on both sides that think the, you see what I'm saying? Yeah. And there's guys that think it is the biggest deal that has ever been done. I'm telling you, you know what is going to be the biggest deal in this game if it happens? I talked about it with Bill. If Fox goes to Fox Bet for the Elite Series in the four states, now you open it up to a fan base that all they're all they're wanting to see now is these guys catch fish that they just wagered on and in the four states. Bill said it in his interview on BTO that the viewing population is more vested in the competition or what is on Fox yeah. Sports if they're wagering on it, which yeah. we have said for years, take the wagering money Vegas aspect out of it and you have fantasy fishing. Yeah. It's why, in my opinion, during the season, why Bass can say they have millions and millions of clicks because 500 of those is me refreshing the Bass track <laughs> and everyone else refreshing their Bass track because not only do they want to see what's happening, they want to see if their guy who's got six pounds catches a five pounder to give them 50 extra bonus points so they win their little fantasy fishing league. It's the same thing on a micro scale. Now I'm you make you. it even bigger yeah. and you put actual money in it. I'm with you, man. It is huge, and I know Fox Bet. It's only four states right now. I believe it's Colorado, mm-hmm. Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and what's the other one? Delaware, I think. I can't remember. But dive it, into the underbelly. Of it's gonna professional it, it's gambling. Gonna, it's gonna expand, and uh, I think that might be the most important thing to making the sport better. How would that is getting it. would that add any money to the purses? Would that would there here it is. I'm a professional angler. I'm on the mm-hmm. Bassmaster Elite series. Fuck. Whoa. Fox Bet is doing I am now on is am I gonna make more money as an elite series angler because people can legally bet on this? How does that impact me, my family? Well, what it impacts is the demographics and the amount of people that are watching the game, which in turn should increase the advertising revenue, which in turn... Trickle-down effect. ...should increase the prize funds. Trickle-down effect. Okay. All right. Uh, Speaking of competition... Yeah. The schedule for the inaugural TNPFL was announced, National Professional Fishing I saw that. Uh, Now, some of this stuff has been kind of leaked over the past weeks a couple but it officially went out uh yesterday uh lake uh, start march april june july august and october the championship has not been named yet but we're talking about lake you fall in alabama march 11th through 13th right patman lake uh which i don't know anything about but it's got to be better than Louisville in texarkana kansas uh texas uh april 22nd through 24th harris chain june 3rd through 5th pickwick july 15th through 17th lake winnebago august 19th through 21st and grand lake september 30th through october 2nd those are the six for the inaugural tmpfl or npfl however you want to say it yeah five grand entry fee and here's the thing that i noticed uh, it was obvious to me based upon the verbiage that was on the MPFL website, uh, obviously there was some coordination of making sure that they didn't schedule on top of the opens, even though the open schedule is not out. Yeah, the open schedule, uh, let me see, you you talk about rumors, has been rumored to be released for the past month to last week. I would expect it to be out before Christmas. I'd really hope it would be out before Christmas. I mean, I, you, you, yeah. you kind of look at some unofficial dates, and it appears that there are no overlaps. But, I, I mean, who knows if those dates are right? I've heard all sorts of different stuff for the Opens. I've heard two divisions. I've heard three divisions. I've heard overall. I heard no overall. Now I heard back to overall. Three divisions all over the board, starting early, starting at March. It's, everyone's got their theory, and everyone has their guy who's like, this is it and then don't show this to anyone else yeah and then they all just conflict and and overlap but i i think i would be fairly safe in saying that there are not any overlapping dates between the mpfl which uh uh was one of their things that they wanted people to be able to still fish the opens and and fish the npfl uh and the and the opens yeah it's funny i'm looking at the uh youtube instant feedback and brian says mark did you guys at UPS always want to know what FedEx was up to? And the answer is absolutely yes. 
<laughs> you know what we found out? A lot of info, man. A lot of uh, uh, tactical strategy back in my UPS days. What's that? From the customers. You just, just start kind of no, quizzing but they them? Would, no, they would, they would tell us. They would say, hey, look, man, if you want our business... This is, what, do this. this is what FedEx is doing. How can you come in and match this? And then you call someone in the office and you yeah. say, hey, get on this. Guess what I they're doing, a, man. I need a report. And then everyone gets around the conference table and they have a PowerPoint on how... Yeah. Is that how that works in the world of business? A long time ago. Well, what is it now? Just uh, emails and digital. Zoom? And yeah, a lot, a lot different. But yeah, back in the day. So yes, we always want to know what the competition right. is doing. Guinea pigs have many biological similarities Told to you. humans. Uh... Dude, people think I'm stupid. I know a few things. I know a couple of things, man. Help develop replacement heart valves. Yeah. Blood transfusions, antibiotics, and asthma medicines, as well as vaccines. Yeah. For diphtheria? Yeah, I don't know what that and is. And TB. That's tuberculosis, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, yeah. They've also been yeah. recruited to test new vaccines against a anthrax. Oh, that was a 2005. Yeah. Hey, Maynard has a good question here. He says, uh, let's see here. Would you make a bet if you knew very little about bass fishing? Uh, that depends on your level of degenerate gambling. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, is that not a fair answer? Uh, do people not bet on football that know nothing about football? Uh, absolutely. All the time. Parlays? Absolutely. You know, but, but a lot of times, why are they picking that? Because there's someone who's it's claiming their... that they know about it. Yeah. That they're subscribing and paying more money to to say, hey, this is these are the picks. You want the over at this game, the yeah. under at this game, take this parlay. Hey, dude, you made the statement when we tried to do the debacle from Table Rock last Monday. Oh, God, I'm sorry about that. All right. I... It, it was thumbs up, thumbs down. Would you take a six figure income if Fox paid you to handicap the field? Or would you fish the Bassmaster Elite Series? And your response was, I would fish the Bassmaster Elite Series. Uh, yeah, I mean, six figures is a wide range. I mean, it could start the one or nine. I, okay, 125 grand. Man. <laughs> it's where your heart is compared to where your bank account is. Do I have to worry about, like, the mob coming after me no. if I pick it wrong or anything? Like, no. it's totally safe? I won't no. need, like, at-home protection? Dude. No. I don't know. That's a, tough, that's a tough decision, but... No, it's not. It's an easy decision. I would fish. I, I mean, I understand why you would do that, but from a financial perspective, not a good decision. In I my can't, do, can't do both. Can't do both. Got to do one or the other. Man, that's just, like giving up what you love to do for money but what's the whole purpose of having money to be able to do what you love to do well <laughs> we could do a dissertation on that entire statement right there matthew there's some truth to it though. part of making money is to establish when you get to a point in your life that you don't have to work anymore right but what if you don't consider your work work okay you're probably in the one percent about one percent of the people that that's how that exists. I understand. I would be open to the. I would definitely entertain the. Uh, the money. I would definitely entertain the possibility. Yeah, dude, I I get it. I mean, fishing the elite series, lifelong dream, especially if you get the opportunity to play and you earned it and you're doing what you love to do. I get it. All right, there is a fine-tuned balance there that very few people in this country are able to do both, make a lot of money and do what they want to do. So. Uh, that would be cool if you could do both. All right. Uh, what else, Matthew? Anything else? We're going to no, take a we break. Could have talked about the uh, NPFL. Oh, dude, I was telling you before off air, you know, we did the deal at Table Rock. Did you win? No, we got second. Justin McClellan smoked everyone. So you didn't win the griddle? No, but we, no, I was a half pound off on the griddle. That was big, right. big bass on, yeah. on the practice day. But 30, 40, 50, 60. 70, 80 foot deep bass. Yeah. Not knowing whether it's a largemouth, a smallmouth, a spotted bass. It was crazy fishing. Yeah, it's fun. And uh, a lot of the guys who have fished that lake for decades said they're catching in ways they never caught them before. And they don't know whether it's because the water was so high in the spring and now it's down and the fish are so deep or because it's been so stable that it's so clear or because the thermocline switched early that now the fish are in all, but like you can't, couldn't go down the bank and get a bite. 
but you could go 80 foot deep and get a bite. Yeah. I watched Hallman catch a seven pound walleye on back to back casts. Well, I he caught one of them and then he threw it back and I was like, no, because oh. we were fishing the same <laughs> stuff. And then he comes in and he's like, hey, I got a seven pounder. And I said, I watched you throw it back. He said, oh, while you were idling out, I caught another one. 70 foot of water. That's pretty cool. That's that's cool fishing. All right, we're going to take a break. Come back with Jeremiah Clark with Lawrence. Everybody stay tuned on a Tuesday. The ultimate fishing system starts with Lawrence HDS Live. The best fish finding tools, from chirp sonar and fish reveal to side scan and down scan imaging, and complete touchscreen control from your trolling motor to your big motor. We've paired one of the most iconic hulls in the history of bass boats with a proven lineup of trusted accessories. We're bringing you best-in-class value and performance, leaving others in your wake. Turnkey value, turnkey performance. The Pantera 2 is an overachiever in the 19-foot category. Once you hit the throttle, you'll feel the rush, and there's no looking back. Kevin, what are you doing here? Oh, I'm just filling in for Billy. I need a 660 Shad crankbaits in uh, the Series 5 model. We're out. You're not out. You got all kinds of them right there. We're out. Kevin, I need six. Have a lollipop. I do not want a lollipop. Have a lollipop. Do you have it in sexy shad color? Let's face it, fishing electronics are no longer an afterthought. They've become a necessity. And at the Bass Tank, our experts match you with the right electronics, provide professional installation, and educate you to help maximize your catching results while providing support along the way. <laughs> because let's be honest, it's about catching, not just fishing. And when you're ready for better results, join the Bass Tank team. Visit us today on Facebook or go to thebasstank.com. Hey everybody, Todd Faircloth here. Want to show you one of my favorite braided lines, SX1 30 pound Sunline Braid. I use this braided line for a couple of different applications and one of my favorites to use for this line is a swim jig. Cast great and it's small diameter and uh, just works really great on a swim jig. Another technique I like to use for 30 pound SX1 Sunline Braid is whenever I'm flipping like a light, say an eighth to a quarter ounce weight in grass, small diameter, I don't lose much action on my worm, just works great in those scenarios. So if you're looking for a braided line for a swim jig or fishing a light Texas rig, check out Sunline's SX1 30 pound braid. AFCO's new URI performance shirts are made out of a new fabric. Aero mesh technology, aero mesh fabric, really breathable. You know, it just doesn't stick to you whenever you're sweating. It's 105 in Florida. You know, you got sun beating down, there's hardly any wind. You know, your shirt won't stick to your back or anything like that. Any little breeze gets through it. And all the AFCO features that you like with the hood, not without a hood, depending on which one you like. It's got odor technology, so your pits don't stink whenever you're sweating. It has thumb loops. So whenever you're driving down the lake, 70 miles an hour in a bass boat, you got thumbs through here, sleeves won't roll up, so you have no excuse if you get somewhere. Any little breath of air gets through you and cools you down, so make sure you check them out. Any fish, any water, any condition, AFCO has you covered. We are back, Good Mark Lord. and Matt in studio. What's wrong, man? That was like 2010 music. 
for your four commercial there, Mark. <laughs> that was no, like wasn't. back in the day when we were having chats with you, like, hey, man, the, the metal just. Sorry. No, I like it. Like yeah. I said, it was vintage. Jeffries, like when you were in there, when you'd be like talking to you and you'd literally have to like hit you and you'd have just just banger music yeah. on for everything. It'd be like a like a interview with David Fritz, who's like, <laughs> well, I was just slow cranking. And then you just are like, throw some metal in there. Yeah, yeah. I um, like it. It's a very, I've, uh, I've it's a vague yet uh, a very telling little teaser. Yeah, there. I've gotten all kinds of messages, what people think it the four is so uh we will announce it next week right here on the show next wednesday you will learn what uh the four is all about so it is time now to go to our special guest and uh matthew very excited to have him on he spent uh a ton of his career working on this project so i want to bring him in now and let's hear what he has to say about lawrence's new product jeremiah you there man i'm here guys how are you guys doing well uh thank you so much for taking time out. I think this is very important for the people to truly understand what the new product is about that Lawrence has uh, recently launched called Active Target. And uh, this is your opportunity to tell people, man, we, we know who was uh, the first one really to kind of uh, set the trend. Now Lawrence is jumping in with uh, what is a really, really cool product. So uh, tell the people about it, man. Yeah, so um, kind of the, 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 the short story of what we're doing here or what we've been doing here is, you know, the, yeah, our competitor beat us to market on this, but this has been on our roadmap since 2013. Uh, we've been working our way to this. Uh, this technology has been available in the commercial space for decades, right? So this, um, in terms of being a, a new and unique technology, you know, the, the physics are about 100 years old. The technology is a couple decades old. Really, the, the magic of what we try to do in our business is bring some of those super high-end features that were only found on, like, military ships or, um, you know, survey vessels and try to figure out how to bring those down to a package and a price that, a, that an angler, a weekend angler, you know, a guy like you and I can afford to put on our boats and go fish. Um, so we've had this as a, as a, as a target, no, no pun intended, on our roadmap for six, seven years now <clears throat> and been working our way towards this. Um, you know, the actual product project itself, uh, spending money, having engineers dedicate time, you know, we kicked that off about two years ago. So that's been, you know, I've heard you guys kind of allude to it in the intro that I've spent a ton of my career. That's two of my 11 years at, uh, at Lawrence working on this project and trying to get it to where it is. And we had one clear goal from day one, and that is to be the highest resolution, best, clearest imagery uh, in live sonar uh, in, in, the, in this space, right? And we wanted no compromises. We wanted the absolute best. Uh, and I'm, I'm pretty sure that, we, you know, uh, when people get to see this, when they see the videos that are posted, uh, when they see some of the stuff we may run through today, that it's pretty clear that, you know, we, we have made a very high resolution, very clear product that's actually, uh, you know, up to this point, we've always called them fish finders, right? <clears throat> Basically, we go out, we see little blobs or little things on screen, and we say, that's a fish. This is the one piece of technology that we're going to finally have. Um, that allow you to actively be a participant in that fishing other than just looking down and saying, hey, there's something there. You can see the fish move. You can see how they relate to cover. Uh, you can see how they react to your presentation. Are you making the wrong, uh, you're giving them the wrong bait? Are you fishing too fast, too slow, uh, too shallow, too deep? So, you know, this, this technology where we got the name is it allows you to actively target your next catch. What makes it better, Jeremiah? Um, without giving away the secret sauce, I will, I'll give you guys kind of the, the 10,000 foot view of this. And, you know, basically again, the technology is, is, is a couple decades old, uh, but it really was designed for, you know, big military type applications or survey applications. What makes ours better, um, than what's out in the recreational space is we've again, intended to target from day one clarity and resolution. So without going too much into details on that, we made our transducer a little bit bigger. Um, uh, and that allows us to have, we'll just say, uh, the transducer, uh, capabilities to get a higher resolution image, uh, than what's uh, previously out there. Um, we also made some conscious choices around how focused that beam is. So you guys know our previous product live site was a 40 degree cone and you could see a lot of water uh, and you could see a lot of things in the water, but you didn't necessarily know if your bait was directly in front of that fish. You knew that they were bait, you know, they could be going down different lanes of the highway, but you'd see that, yeah, they're, they're there at the same place, but then, you know, they may not be there in the same, uh, exactly lined up. So with ours, we are, we're only a couple degrees narrower than what's already in the market. Um, but that narrowness has really allowed us to sharpen our detail. Um, one, you know, 
one thing that we'll see if we did a head to head is that that <clears throat> the wider cone of what's already in the market, the bottoms may look thicker, but our bottoms look more defined. So you could actually tell if it's a rocky bottom, a grass bottom, um, those kind of things. And also, you know, if you see the bait and you see the fish that they are there within each other. Uh, so, you know, really just that that's the, the, the base level is really the difference between us and what's what others have done is really in the hardware and also the software. We have the best engineers in the market, the best sonar engineers in the market. Uh, our, our, our DSP, our digital signal processing guys have spent a ton of time on this product. It's one, you know, it's one thing to say that the technology exists. It's like saying a, a, a LCD TV has been around forever, right? But there are better LCD TVs than others. Um, and really it comes down to the level of hardware that the team put into the product and also the engineers you have designing and writing the software for that product. So the, 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 the simple answer is clarity resolution. That's what makes us better. Um, you know, it's, it's the same style of technology, but we, we believe we've done it better. I'm going to ask a dumb question here, but I'm curious. So you yeah. have all these people that are designing this stuff, like you said engineers, like what, what do most of these people go to school for? Like, what Man. is their, like, what are their degrees in to be able to understand this? Are they like military stuff or is it, I mean, like, how do you end up designing a fish finder or we have whatever? A yeah, we have a completely mixed bag when it comes to that. Um, we do have people with that have PhDs in acoustics. So basically that's, that's all they know is sound. And basically sonar is just, I mean, not basically sonar is sound underwater. So our, we have guys with PhD in acoustics. We have guys that are, you know, master's level, PhD level in digital signal processing, which is really, you know, kind of the magic in the software. We have some people that have come from former companies that have done military type sonar. We've got some, you know, a few of those guys that have worked on submarines before uh, making sonars for those. Um, we have, just people that have gone to school for mechanical engineering that are great at making brackets. And, you know, it sounds kind of dumb to say, but like the bracket of this thing is just as important as the transducer is. So it really does take a, it takes a full complement. It takes a bunch of specialties. Um, and, you know, we've, we pretty much, uh, like I say, I, I have no, no doubt saying we have the best of the best in the industry. Like the people that work on our products are passionate about our products. Um, and that, that really goes into it too. All right. Now, some people, they are intimidated by this technology. What is the ease of use like for this particular technology? So for me, getting on the water and seeing it for the first time uh, with our with our product actually working, I've, I've played with others plenty. Um, but seeing ours working the first time and basically spending the summer, I, I keep saying testing in air quotes because I've got I had to go fish a lot this summer to make sure it actually worked. <laughs> um, it, was, it was brutal. But, uh, you know, so, but the thing for me is it took me back to, as you guys remember 2009, 2010, when side scan and down scan first came on the market, right? And everybody was a little bit put off saying, you know, I'd go to a trade show and somebody's like, well, I'm looking on the screen and I can't tell what I'm looking at. I say, well, what does it look like? Well, it looks like a rock. Well, it's probably a rock, you know? And I think that's the thing is actually just going out and looking at the stuff and believing what your eyes are telling you, right? Again, in the sonar world for 40 years, We've been looking at different shades of red, yellow, and blue and saying, oh, that's probably a rocky bottom with, you know, this and that. And now I can look at it and see it. The other kind of learning curve or intimidation factor that I've experienced, and I've seen a few of our pros experience that have gotten to play with this, is really trust your fishing and don't always, you know, everything you see on the screen, don't react to it. So I've actually yanked baits out of fish's mouth. The fish will come rocketing up to eat my lure. And I'm like, oh, here he comes, and I'll set the hook before he even bites or before he takes a full bite. So really, it's just believing what your eyes show you and then not believing what your eyes show you and just feel, believing what you feel, right? Like, wait for that bite, wait for the hook, you know, to set the hook like you normally would. But other than that, it's really just get on the water, look at it, and go. One of the things that, that I find interesting is the units progress and progress and progress. You talk to the guys who are like, well, I just turn it on, and it, and it is whatever it is. And then you get in the water with the guy like, john from the bass tank and he's like oh your your gain has to be up one and your clarity down and there's three foot of visibility so i'm going to go with this different color palette and now you're like well maybe i don't know what i'm doing <clears throat> but it seems as it's progress and progress it's almost just like turn it on and go like is that a, a big factor as you guys i mean you have these guys with build acoustics and digital signal processing how hard is it to try to package that in something where you can just hit a couple buttons and it's exactly what they need to see that covers the gamut from all different conditions. I mean, I would imagine that's kind of a challenge and, and the ultimate goal is to just plug and play. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question and a good observation is, you know, that is one of the reasons that these projects do take so long is trying to figure out how to make it just work. That's one of the goals is we want it to just work. Um, when you look in the menu of this product, we don't have a lot of controls. And 
I always tell people like, you know, my, my standard answer when it comes to like regular sonar or side scan is, you know, kind of leave it in auto mode. We'll do the work for you. I'm pretty sure you're not as smart as our guy that's got a PhD in sonar, right? Um, but there are the 10% of people that are really good at dialing things in and they're always going to want to tune and tweak. But with this product, you don't have to do much tuning and tweaking, right? We basically have noise rejection, which is how much background noise do you want versus how do you want small targets to come in? We have the color palette, which is a personal preference on how your eyes want to see it or maybe what you want to see that day. And then from there, we basically have a brightness setting. So you can turn the, the contrast up or down if you wanted to make smaller targets pop a little more. Um, I, I personally think the more controls you have to put in a product, the worse you've made the product. Okay. How is it going to compare price-wise to the competition? Uh, well, so retail price, we're exactly the same. The big difference is we have in the box, we include our bracket to do all three views. So for the, for the purchase price, you get this bracket, which gives you forward, down, and scout mode all in, all in the box for shaft mount. Um, we also have the, the mounts in the box for trolling motor if you need to mount it on the, the actual head of the motor. So retail price, we're about the same. But if you look at the addition of that $100 bracket that our, that our friends need to, uh, to get their perspective view, then we're actually $100 cheaper. The thing that I've noticed in the past couple of years, you've got the packages where now your trolling motor works with your transducer, which works with your graph, which is all linked together. Explain the advantages of the forward facing technology with the ghosts, with the live or the carbon and how all those work in unison now. Yeah. Um, one of the things I guess saw it in one of your, uh, your commercials you ran was uh, we do promote and believe in 100% the ultimate fishing system, right? We believe that if you buy Lowrance everything, the simplicity, the connectivity to use it all on screen, the touch screen, you know, to basically is your command center uh, to just make everything intuitive, uh, simply easy to use. Um, you know, when it comes to integrating a ghost to, uh, to an active target, uh, you know, it's really, it's just a matter of mounted on the shaft. Uh, and, you know, the, I guess the only interaction you would have is we do have the ability to go to cursor. So if you saw a cool piece of structure on your active target uh, screen, you could put the crosshairs up and say, go to, and your ghost trolling motor would take you right to that piece of structure. You don't have to set a waypoint, you know, configure out where you're going to go. You just tap it and go. Um, but really the, the whole thing is basically everything from the, the prop on the front of the boat to the prop on the back of the boat, we have the ability to integrate and make your life simple. So you don't have to run all over the boat, play with a ton of remotes. You just, it's all right there at your fingertips, whether it's, you know, controlling your, uh, you know, controlling your trolling motor, controlling your outboard engine, setting waypoints. It'll show up in every place in the boat that your controlling motor could take you to. Uh, again, it's all right there at your fingertips. So a couple of people on the instant feedback are saying, uh, so basically no difference between what, what you have and what the competition has. That's not what you just said. If you had to summarize what the big difference is between this product and your competitor's product, what would it be? Clarity, resolution. Yeah. That's it. I mean, that's like saying there's no difference in first generation side scan and second or third generation side scan, right? Like yeah. the, the technology is the same. That's, there's no doubt. Like a car is a car, right? But if you saw a car from 1970 and a car from 2020, they're different things, right? They both have four wheels. They both have a wind, windshield, but they're not the same car. They're the same platform. So our technology is similar to what they're using. It's, it's something called frequency steered sonar arrays. You could go Google it if you're, if you're like sonar nerd like I am and you want to learn how it all works. Um, <laughs> But really, the, the difference is the difference in that clarity and that resolution. That is 100%. We went all in on that without sacrificing anything else that, uh, that they do today. What is it again? Say it a little slower. I got to write it down because I am one of those nerds who wants to look at yeah, it. Yeah, it's, it's, called, it's called frequency steered sonar or frequency steered uh, arrays. Um, the, the, the high level, not super nerdy pitch. I give this pitch to my boss. Who's a, who's an avid fisherman too. And he, he, he does start to blink out on me a little bit when I tell him, but the high level of way frequency steer works is you have sectors. So you guys have seen videos online, whether they're ours or somebody, uh, somebody else's where you can actually see like six individual little beams that come down. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and then I'll get to the, the kind of where I think our magic is too, at, towards the end of this. Um, but out of those, out of those six beams, basically, if you look at a transducer, so, you know, people are going to say that this is the, basically the same as what's out there. And that's driven by the physics. That's driven by the technology. This is the same basic layout you have in the commercial sonars that existed for 20 years. And that is because each one of these, we'll just call them transducers in here. There's one there, one here, and one here. So I have three basic transducers in this transducer housing. Um, and each one of these does two of those sectors. Uh, but they're not next to each other. So you can't have like one transducer giving you uh, 
45 degree cone. You have two transducers giving you 22 and a half degree cones, but one's here and one's here. Uh, and so it takes all three of these to sew together the six sectors to give you that front to back view that you guys are used to seeing. Um, so that, that part of the technology, like I say, that's just driven by the physics. But um, the way that, you know, back to frequency steered sonar, the way that it works is each one of those sectors will sweep from a low frequency to a high frequency. And that is the frequency steered part of the frequency steered array. And that's how we make motion or see motion. We don't make it. We, we actually are reading it by sweeping hundreds of frequencies through those arrays, adding up all six arrays into one picture. And there you go. You have live sonar. Now, one thing that, you know, I talked about those sectors. And again, the thing that makes us better is we've done a lot of work and a lot of extra processing to blend those sectors together. So you don't see the harsh lines and your bottoms line up. Uh, you don't have the big gaps. You don't see the fan. I've heard it called the fan in the screen. Like you have a nice, clean, clear picture all the way through. Um, one, one, one thing with the technology, if you look at videos close enough, you'll see that there are parts of each of those sectors that um, look a little less detailed and parts that look a little higher detailed. And that's just a matter of what frequency is going through that part of the sector. Lower frequency is going to be lower resolution, just like side scan. Higher frequency is going to be higher resolution. All right, several questions coming in. We'll take this one, and then I believe that you have some stuff that you're going to show us. Yeah, uh, we've got a little show and tell we could go through. All right, Forrest wants to know, I've got the 9-inch live. Do I have to dedicate the whole screen to the live target? You don't have to, no. You can, you can do uh, active target in a, in a split screen just like you could any other sonar technology. Um, with it being a video feed to the unit from a box, uh, there are you can't scale it exactly like you can any like sonar panel. Uh, so you might have to play around with the, the scaling to find something that, you know, where you fill up most of the box you do. But uh, so a nine inch screen, you can split four ways. So you could do side scan, down scan, live sonar and a chart if you wanted to. Uh, 12 and 16 inch screens, we can split six ways. So you can pile all kinds of information on those screens. Is there a, a unit that is best for this technology, Jeremiah? My Personal favorite right now, just because it's high resolution in a very dense format, is the nine-inch screen, the HDS Live Nine. Really, I have I have two. But I questions. I love the sixteen too. But sixteen's full HD, um, and it, it basically it's it's going to shine like nobody else is going to shine. But if you're looking to add an affordable unit, um, the HDS Live Nine, or we just even announced the Elite FS Nine. The difference in those is the FS Nine is not going to be as high resolution as the HDS Nine, but it's still a great screen for it. Uh, the key word that, that I see on this is live and, live and the fact, you know, you're not looking at something that's scrolling, you're looking at it. Talk about the challenges in relaying live imaging on the screen without a delay. Um, cause that's big. I mean, especially when yeah. you're trying to put your lure in the same and the fish is constantly moving. I mean, if you have a second, <clears throat> two second delay, which doesn't seem like much, I mean, that you've seen how fast fish swim that fish could be 30 feet away by then so uh, was that something that that is hard to to and the importance of it the, the importance live? of it yeah the importance of it's paramount right like so we we actually did some research on what do people perceive as live and we set our response time target to be underneath that um but what that does mean is you guys can't feel this but this box that we use this is cast aluminum this whole box is a heat sink so basically the days of taking a plastic box and jamming them somewhere where they don't need airflow or any of that kind of stuff, we need to get those days behind us because it takes a lot of processing power uh, in, in both the sonar side and the graphic side to render a live image, um, something that your mind sees as live. Um, what that processing power does is just like your computer or, you know, for the guys that were, you know, used to play around in car stereos, it goes car amplifiers, right? Like those power equals heat, heat equals a metal box, metal box equals you need ventilation. So there's a, a lot went into it. You know, you, you don't think that like this, this box that we have is a direct relationship to uh, us wanting a live picture that when you twitch your lure, you see your lure moving in real time. When I was, you know, talking about the learning curve for me and actually pulling the lure out of a fish's mouth, that's how live it is. I can see him come up, I can see him go, and I can see me not be as good of an angler as I should be. <laughs> okay, then the next question on this is, is what is the functional forward reach because it being you know fish in the open you talk to guys with the forward facing sonar and some are like well I, I can't catch them past 50 and now guys are like oh i'm i'm seeing them at 70 and other guys yeah. like well i have mine out at 100 and now it's like a bragging contest how far out in front of the dang boat you can catch a fish 
Yeah. So it, it kind of talk about the, the functional reach uh, of the new product. I, I like how you put that functional because there is a max depth yeah. and a max range. Like if I'm looking at a bridge, I can see that bridge 200 plus feet away, right? But I'm not fishing for a bridge. I'm fishing for a fish. I usually set my, my range personally at 80 to 120. I feel like that's when I start to get the best picture. Um, and I, you know, I'm not uh, one of the, the big tour pros, heavy hitters. I can't cast much further than that anyway. Even though I spent most of my, that's probably why I spent most of my life playing baseball. My shoulder's shot, so I can only throw a lure so far. Um, but, you know, I think I would say functional range. I usually don't go much beyond 120, 150 if I'm trying to look at there are a lot of trees or some cover that I'm missing. Um, depending on the bait and the water conditions, you can track baits out, you know, 70, 80 feet, 60, 70, 80 feet, depending on the bait, how deep it dives, how big mm -hmm. and reflective it is. Um, but I'd say that if I were just to give you, if I were to say, hey, Matt, let's go to the water and let's put this on, the, I would say put your forward range at 80 or 120 until you find what you're looking for. I really don't like changing forward range too much because I like things to stay roughly the same size, the same scale. Um, so I usually, if I'm fishing in 20 feet of water, I'll pick a down range of 30 and a forward range of 80 or 120 and I'll leave it alone. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I mean, yeah, I, I would say max range, published range, we've seen over 200 feet, but I'm not going to tell somebody they're going to see a bass at 200 feet. Yeah, and... and 70 is about uh, 70 is a healthy cast. That's a pretty 70 healthy to 80 cast. is a, a very healthy cast. Yeah. All right. Uh, a couple of people want to know where's the best place to mount that box, Jeremiah? We've, that's going to depend boat by boat, right? So we've um, given you 20 feet of transducer cable and 15 feet of Ethernet cable. So on any bass boat, bay boat, walleye boat, anything like that, you can stick this pretty much anywhere you want and network it. I'm going to recommend in a rod locker where you have good airflow. Um, we're seeing some people, you know, kind of cram them up in bow plates. And I really, again, don't recommend that because um, you need airflow around that box. You need some good, you know, some good ventilation. Uh, if you have some of the boats with, you know, bigger bow plates, you take them off and it's almost like a spare locker. Then yeah, sure. Go ahead and, you know, put it in there. Um, but it is sensitive electronics. You do want to be able to bolt it down. Um, and again, the way we kind of designed it, you know, we look at the profile. We designed it to mount to a wall so the connectors come out down here um, or to a floor so the connectors come out. But really, I, I, if I'm putting them in a boat today, I'm going to try to stick them in a rod locker or in, a, in just a, a locker on the front deck. You can go all the way. You know, on most bass boats, you can get to the console easily. Some bass boats, you can even get to the lockers behind the console. Uh, but just kind of something out of the way. I mean, it's boat by boat. All right. So what can you show us? What do you have to show us? Man, um... More than probably we have time for. So when I get a little bit too geeked out here, you're going to have to stop me. Um, but I, I do have just some kind of images and videos, you know, that we're um, kind of a little presentation we've done. You know, there's the transducer in the module. That's not the most exciting part of it. We do have, you know, the different views. And I think this is kind of important to, to know what you can get out of this product. We have do, do have forward, down, and scout mode. This is showing it on the actual trolling motor shaft mount itself with that adjustable mount that does all three views. Uh, this is a bridge in Lake Hudson, Oklahoma. We're on a 120 foot range and this is in 40 feet deep of water to give you guys an idea. Matt, back to your question about what can you see and how far? I think this shot is a great example to show that. Um, where is just, that you know, on Hudson? The, uh, that is, uh, where, uh, <laughs> where, what is it? 82 goes over the Hudson and you go, if you went to like towards the pump back side, yeah. that little cove, it's right there. I got you. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's, that's, that's in about 40 feet of water. It's out in the middle of nowhere. Like you, we, we were driving along uh, years ago and saw this on side scan. It's like, what the heck? It's just this gorgeous bridge. Uh, we've actually found that we really like shooting bridges because man-made structure gives you an idea of detail. Clear, you know, what it, it, does this look like what it would look like to my eyes if I were driving down the road? Uh, but also all those little dots, you see those swimming around real time. Those are fish. These fish right here are probably about 60, 70 feet away from the boat. So that gives you an idea of what we're getting in terms of a reach reach with this product and clarity at that distance you have the download which i got some videos of this this is a big school of crappie that we were just plucking them off and then you have scout mode which we'll talk about here in a little bit too um really to kind of give you guys an example of what we've got i kind of like to compare it to the technologies we're used to right so we're all used to what down scan and side scan look like these days so like just kind of showing off the resolution we're able to get uh this is uh, again on sky took this is an old road bed that a creek went underneath it. Uh, and this is what it looks like on side scan. You could actually tell that there was a road bed with kind of like a little uh, bridge culvert going underneath it. And then when we did active imaging, when we stepped up our side scan game, we actually saw these little supports inside and thought, man, what the heck are those? Are they reflections? What are they? 
Well, now that we have live sonar and we can look directly down the side of it, we can see that those supports are really exactly what they look like, their support. This is in about uh, 30, uh, eight, an 80 foot range. So this is max 80. So we're probably 50 foot here and 35 feet of water. And you can see that tree perfectly. You can see the rocky uh, edge on top of here, but then looking right down that culvert. Uh, kind of an example of what a, bridge, you know, a brush pile looks like on this live versus what it looks like in side scan. You know, you can actually see the trunks and the individual branches sticking up from this. So this is basically almost like down scan quality with fish swimming around in real time. But really the magic isn't in the, um, isn't in pictures. The magic's in videos. So this one's one that I like. This is one sent in from one of our testers. You got this big fish on the bottom there. You got the guy jigging his bait and he thinks he's about to get hit and the fish actually eats another fish. And it kind of ex ex just kind of shows to me the most frustrating thing about live sonar is every time you put your bait in the water, somebody's going to come take a look at it. But they may not necessarily be coming to eat your bait. So it does teach you a lot about an angler as an angler. Uh, it could also show that, you know, the, the lure was enough to get his attention, but the, the fish looked a little better when he got there. So that's one thing to show a screenshot, but let's show an actual video. So this is a cell phone video. You know, people are going to accuse us of doctoring, faking, smoke and mirrors. This is live. This is a cell phone video. You can see the guy's reflection. That's the bait going down. That's the fish swimming up to the bait. And as the fish turns, watch its fins, its tail, everything you can just see in perfect detail. Now, this is actually out of Europe, so this is in meters. This isn't feet. So this is 30 feet, 33 feet deep of water, and that fish is about 15, 20 feet deep. That's a good-sized fish. That's a, it's what they call a xander. It's basically a big walleye. That but, thing's I mean, huge. That thing, yeah, if you want to get a, get a good idea of what it looks like, um, how about that? What does a fish look like on the screen versus what does it look like in your boat? And the only thing I can tell is the fish on the, on the measuring board is a little less gold than what it looks like on the live sonar. So if you guys want an idea of like where we're at detail-wise, I mean, there's nothing better than this, right? Like this shows you that fish is that fish. Wow. Then we've got the down mode. So, I, you know, um, this is actually a shot from last week. We did our live webinar. I don't know if you guys saw that. We posted on the rants.com live. Uh, where we took uh, Jordan Lee and Gary Klein out and, and kind of launched these products to the world. Uh, but we got special permission uh, from the guys that run the dive site at 10 Killer State Park to go into their dive site and actually look at um, oh, look at some of the structure they had. Again, that's cool. nobody's fishing for a school bus, right? We got that comment in the live webinar, but there are schools of fish on the school bus, but we, we are at looking to see the level of detail we can get. So on the left, this is an old shot. Last time we got permission to go in there, what it looks like on active imaging side and down scan, right? And that's really good detail. You can see the, the metal ribs in the side of the bus. You can see the windows. This is a screenshot of it live on the water last Wednesday. And it's, I like I say, it's down scan quality, but all live. You point the sonar at it, it shows up. You see the fish swim around. You know, Gary, we were on the boat with him, and he was basically saying, look, even on a, on, it was a bluebird sunny day, and he was saying, hey, on, look at this. Even in a cold, sunny day, the fish still like to be on the shady side of the structure. I didn't know that was a real thing. I mean, that's how, yeah, like, these guys, just looking at this and looking at it live and watching him react, it was just amazing to pick out that little detail. But, again, just kind of comparing what do you have in downscan versus what can you get in live sonar, and, like, it's, it's pretty dang close detail-wise. But the thing is, we're not fishing for buses. I call this, the, the, the down mode is basically the crappie live well filler, man. If you're vertically fishing or jigging like we are right here, you can pick out the fish you want. Watch this fish come up and hit it. Off to the boat you go. So those are all individual crappies swimming around this brush pile. There's two schools. We've got a much longer video of this to, you know, that we could show. I think it's actually in the demo of the product. So when we get these in stores and we update the units on the shelf, there'll be a much longer version of this video that you could watch. But this whole school starts to swim around, a couple more fish catches in here, but this is basically, this this view is not fair to crappie. Like you could just roll up on a brush pile, drop a jig down and pick out the ones you want. Wow. Uh, and then we got this video. Uh, this is actually on YouTube uh, from one of our Italian distributors actually. Uh, but this is again, some. I think about 40, 50 feet deep water. And uh, this is a down view of looking at a bridge and give it just a second. He kind of puts it into focus. You can see the railings. You can see the road bed. You can see the individual bricks down here. Like when you want to talk resolution, that's, that's amazing to me. Uh, I hadn't even seen this video until I got posted on YouTube and I had to ask our, uh, our marketing team if they knew where I could get it. So uh, that's the, I think, you know, I, the first day or so I knew all, every piece of content that was coming out and now I'm seeing stuff that's wowing me because I've never seen it before and it's applications. I never would have thought it would have done great in it. It's just, it's just killing. Is there a record feature to where you can put a 
chip in and record your live stuff? Yeah. yeah, so we record everything natively in MP4, so you could actually record and then just take it straight to YouTube or straight to your Instagram and pop it right in there. Um, so this is, we, and that's one reason you don't see, like, you know, you don't see the depth markings on the screen here. Uh, when we record video, we're recording the raw video uh, because, you know, it, we assume if you're recording the video of your live sonar, you want to see the sonar and not every time you touch the screen or change the page. We're not recording the screen of the HDS. We're recording the actual raw live uh, video data. So, yeah, you pop a card in, you, you record, you tell it, you know, you can name it if you want to and off you go. That's how we got all of these for all of this testing. And then the last one I'll show you guys and we can talk a little bit more about anything you want is kind of the scout mode. So scout mode. Um, is one that basically, uh, when we first came out with it, I knew we needed it. We actually had this on our roadmap from 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 day one. I actually tried to you know uh, file for some uh, IP on this last year, and we didn't get there. Um, but this this view basically I'm using for finding school of fish or finding schools of bait fish. You can use it to look out and see structure. This is 40 feet deep of water, looking out at 120 feet. There's a just kind of a roaming school of fish right there, cruising through. Um, again, kind of more along that line, the schooling fish. I had no idea that fish would swim in a perfectly straight line, but here they come down the left side of the screen. They almost swim right into the trolling motor before they freak out and scatter. <laughs> so that was, that was pretty super deep too. And then, you know, obviously this one will be one that's in our demo log. This is the foundations of Bernice and Grand Lake, Oklahoma. Uh, but again, just showing kind of some of the, the resolution and the detail we can get. One I just saw speaking of, um, content showing up that I had no idea what it is, is we have our distributor out of Finland. It apparently has one of these and they were going through a, a small lake. This video is on YouTube, obviously, so I won't play it here, but like there's a small boat sunk in, you know, 10 feet of water. And like just looking out at this flat lake or flat lake bottom that has absolutely nothing going on, you can see those little tiny pieces of structure. So like scout mode, I'm actually, I'm starting to kind of really start to like a lot. Really, I'm still using it more for that, uh, that bait fish or schooling fish view, but just kind of looking at structure is pretty cool too. Hey, what's the resolution of the save video, Jeremiah? Um, I got you had to ask a question I didn't know. I honestly ah, don't. Uh, I don't right. know. I have to. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm a sonar no nerd, not a video nerd, I guess. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I, I don't know, but I, I can find that out and I'll email it to you so you can put it uh, in your notes. Hey, this stuff is incredibly complex. I mean, you talk about all of it, and I mean, you're you're talking about stitching stuff together and then you put it in a bass boat and you go out and run 60 miles and three footers for six months in a row and i mean just beat the crap out of all your stuff i mean you have top cap i mean you it's amazing like how difficult is it to maintain the minute detail of it in something that you i mean like if you took a laptop and did that to it i mean that thing's done in like three bumps yeah, and I guess that's the beauty of us and not, you know, not, not making laptops, right, is um, we build everything to be beat up. We have these machines that we affectionately call the thumpers. Okay, and, that was uh, my question. Like, do yeah. you intentionally beat the stuff up and see we, how long it's... Yeah, we beat the heck out of everything. And we can, we can test hitting it on any axis you want. And we beat things, depending on the, the type of product, and, you know, to 20 or 40 Gs. Uh, so 20 or 40 times gravity. Uh, we we, t we simulate we have, the thumper machine really simulates the just pounding of a boat bow right just over and over just smacking down hard 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 um and you know that machine when it's running you'll know it's running right like it's it's loud mm -hmm. it's obnoxious when you go in the in the when you go in the uh the shop where they're working on that you know before you even get in the building that the thumper's on and we do that not just to transducers and displays but trolling motors um the boxes themselves, cables, brackets. That's how we know that this bracket we built, this is actually the second iteration of the bracket we made for mm -hmm. this project. Um, the first one, we did run into some problems on the thumper where the teeth started to wear out and it just didn't seem like it was going to hold up. So we actually re-engineered along the way. This is actually the second version of the bracket. Uh, but we do that because we do beat stuff to death. I mean, like this is, by the time we put it in the market, we know that something like impact is not going to be an issue. And then, obviously, the name of our show is Bass Talk Live, and yep. we talk about this in the bass world. How much interest, and obviously the crappie world uh, as a whole, but how much interest, is this mainly a bass and crappie thing, or are you seeing, you had Finland stuff, is this something that it, there's groups of anglers for all sorts of species outside of our little realm that are really excited about this stuff, too? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. 
question is um, we actually built this specifically for inland lakes, uh, river streams, those kind of things. So bass, crappie, walleye, like, you know, the, the typical catfish guys, like those guys. But um, yeah, there's so far in the applications we've tested it or taken it to, um, we haven't found a place where it is it's not really doing well like we actually had a had a guy that was in florida like one thing normally we'd be traveling all over the place and testing this as many places as we personally can but obviously 2020 is 2020 mm -hmm. i can't hop on a lot of flights and just take off <clears throat> so we had a guy that was going to be in florida for another event anyway and uh we just said hey why don't you take a quick journey down to key west with some of our friends and they went and looked out at a wreck and um we're actually i could probably pull up some pictures of that too but they were looking at a wreck in 120 feet of water and seeing the perfect detail of the wreck, just as you would see it, uh, you know, if you were down there diving, um, you could see the divers going to the wreck. So like we, we, he looked at one wreck in 80 feet of water that had a barracuda slashing through a bait ball and you could tell clear as day it was a barracuda. Uh, and then at, at the very bottom is this Goliath grouper that's almost as big as the boat wreck itself. So like the applications for this, even though we didn't build this for saltwater, it will sell in salt water and we're going to sell a lot of it in salt water. We built this for the freshwater angler. Me, I'm a bass guy. And like my main focus was coming after this bass crappie walleye catfish kind of market. But, um, we, we, we intentionally focused our efforts here and we turned out to have a really great product that's going to work in a lot more applications than we had initially designed it for. What's next for this technology? Jeremiah. And if I told you that, I'm telling my friends that at the <laughs> down the street too. So um, I would just say we're not done. Um, okay. We 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 have like those that team of brilliant engineers we were discussing earlier in our little chat. Those guys when they when they finish this, they don't just get to take a year off, right? Like we we can have a little bit of celebration period, and then we go again. You know the the next iteration of of our sonar team, right? We're always working on stuff. We're always evolving. Um, the sonar arms race is pretty real, right? As you guys well know. And, you know, if you sit, you for sit for too long, you get caught. Um, and we're not going to sit. We're going to keep developing, keep building. I've got some ideas that, you know, we're, we're working on. And let's just say maybe in a year or so, I'd love to be right back here chatting with you guys. All right. Very cool. Yeah, ton of questions. And uh, are you doing anything else? I know you mentioned the webinars that you're having. Are those weekly? Are those still going on, Jeremiah? What's the scoop? When, when everybody was first in COVID lockdown, we were doing weekly. Now we're doing monthly. Um, we had, you know, initially we were getting something like 1,500 people watch for the entire hour, which for somebody like us that's obviously not used to doing that, and we were kind of doing it gorilla style from garages and those kind of things, that was really good. That, that content generated over half a million uh, views for us, or clicks for us, so that's our impressions. So that's really good. Uh, but as, as uh, lockdowns have eased and people have gotten back out, sports have started back up, um, we've gone to once a month and then just trying to keep it more targeted on um, more tech tips and how to's and those kind of things versus sales pitches. Last week was our first sales pitch we've done since uh, kind of the whole thing slowed down. But yeah, we're, we're going to, we, we plan on keeping our Lawrence live webinar series going. Um, we think it's great, a great way to stay in touch directly with our consumers uh, and give them the information that we think that maybe, uh, we, we can give them some tips on. And like I say, we've done everything there from what is a, a hook reveal to what are the absolute most basic sonar settings you could possibly need if you're a first time user. Uh, and I think that's been great for us. All right. So people out there, I know there were a ton of questions. We really wanted to kind of keep the focus on active target. Uh, but in the future, for the other products and for cable questions and so many other things, just check out their monthly webinar series on Lawrence.com and they'll do everything they can to answer your questions about uh, the Lawrence product. So there you have it. Do you know when the next one is, Jeremiah? Any idea? Um, that would be, we did one last week, so we'll have one in three weeks. Okay. There you have it, folks. I don't know what it is yet. I just know when it is. But, uh, yeah. All right. Anything else, Matthew? No, that's good. I really appreciate it. I like the. I like some of the nerdy answers, as you <laughs> as you call them. I thought you did. I was very, trying not to uh, keep it too nerdy. So very easy to understand. I mean, in yeah. a very very complex thing that you have to kind of wrap your head around, just like we all did, as far as side imaging and two D and what you're looking at, and then you kind of have that moment where you click and you're like, okay. I, yeah. I get it, but the more you understand, in my opinion, the more you understand how it works and why it works, 
the better you'll be able to utilize it. At least yeah, that's would, how it works in my mind. Exactly. And I would say anybody that gets this the first time, it's like we used to tell people with side skin, right? Like take a day, just see what you see and then fish. Um, but you know, it's, it's, it's impossible to do when you see fish schooling up or swimming around, you're going to grab a bait. You're going to grab a drop shot. You're going to go after them. Um, but that's the recommendation. I can't even do it, but that's what I would recommend. <laughs> All right. Last thing. When is this going to be available to the public? Uh, first shipment starting December mass shipments in January. All right. There you have it, folks. That's great stuff, man. Jeremiah, appreciate you taking time out. And, uh, I always say, man, competition makes you better. It does. It, really it does. keeps us all on our toes. Yep. All right, man. Be safe. Have a great Christmas. And uh, we'll have you back on soon, man. All right. Thanks, guys. All right. Take care. All right. See ya. All right. There you have it. Jeremiah Clark. Dude knows his stuff, man. Obviously. Oh, yeah. That's uh, that's pretty cool. Some of the videos and, and cell phone videos. I want to get stuff. one of those acoustic engineers on. <laughs> because obviously, I, okay, I don't know this for a fact. But I would, re- I would assume that you do not, what did he call it, acoustic en- sound engineer or whatever? Yeah, something like I'd that. I'd imagine I you don't go to school for that going, you know what, my lifelong goal is to develop fishing transducers. Like, I mean, there's a whole, you're into all sorts have of you ever abstract, known, crazy stuff. Have you known any engineers in any category that have went on to get their PhD? That have gone on to get their PhD? Yeah. Not that I'm aware of. They're... they're, they're at another level, man. Do you, you do? Oh, yeah. Yeah, Paul Morella, one of my real good friends. Uh, still lives in California, works for some Silicon Valley electronics company. Just a guy that I bowled with, went on to be an electrical engineer, got his PhD from Stanford. Wow. Okay. He's big time, and he's just a different cat, man. Different level, different intelligence, different dedication to be able to to do what he does because we see the screen and we but we don't know how it we don't know how it's working like it's mind-blowing when you actually think (laughs) about what's going on you're taking nothing you're combining things and you're able to see in front of you underwater on a screen it's amazing yeah but those people and there's very few of them can understand how every single component works. Yeah. It's like the guys who are car guys who when you get in a car and you start it and they understand how everything they could literally unbuild and rebuild a car, which I yeah. couldn't which I couldn't do. Yeah. But it's just a whole different level. I would be interested if there's any of these guys that fish, if they care about fishing, if they just are maybe I mean is there is there a maybe is there a, a bidding war for these guys and contracts and stuff? Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, are there... All right, let's get into this discussion now. Now, so many times with so many things, when you're the first one to market, typically you will reap the benefits. Agreed? Correct. With a lot of products and services, you're the first one there. Uh, I'm going to throw a bowling reference in there. I'm, I remember the very first reactive resin bowling ball was a bowling ball called uh, Excalibur. Obviously. All right, Excalibur. The dude made it in his garage. Okay. All right, and the next thing we know, this massive distribution of the Excalibur bowling ball was showing up in bowling centers and leagues and all this and everything. And the rest of the bowling ball industry was not ready for this technology. The consumer was not ready to change their viewpoint of the technology because the first one there was dominating the market. Mm-hmm. The Excalibur, nobody else wanted any, any other kind of reactive resin bowling ball. It took, it took some time for success to happen with another company's reactive resin bowling ball until the consumer finally said, okay, man, that dude just won a tournament with it's a... It's the same thing in hockey sticks, with the a, Eastern Synergy. Yeah. I mean, I was, it was in high school when I saw it. And every, I mean, it was an Eastern Synergy for years and then all of a sudden you started seeing the ccm vectors and then warrior came out with one and then it was like oh okay these other sticks have caught up but for a while they they felt clunky yeah and it was every you know you needed an eastern synergy yeah it's like that i think in anything so for the consumer to grasp at how this technology is being delivered to market and understanding the difference between what Garmin has and what Lawrence has, I think he put it very simply, 
in, in a simple concept was resolution. Okay, so so will the consumer get used to now having an option when it comes to that type of technology? Yeah, they. I mean, uh, dude, it's you go happened to a, with other products. You go to a tournament now and you see Ultrexes and Ghosts and Garmin's. I mean, it didn't take very long before the yeah. trolling motor market was diversified. I mean, it, 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 at one point it was all Ultrexes, right? Not all, but 90% Ultrexes. Because of spot lock. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. now you're seeing them a, a, a lot more diversified in that. Yeah. So we'll see. We'll see. Uh, I think it was very important for the people to understand that this technology is not just a you know, single company now. Uh, and, and there's a lot I'm sure of, info. you'll see it from Humminbird too, coming, oh, coming yeah. down the pipeline. So let me ask yeah. you this then, Mark. Um, so you've been in this industry longer than I have. You've been in a lot of different industries. You talk a lot about, uh, progression, right? Do you feel like the technology has progressed much more rapidly over the past four, five years? than it has in any other five-year chunk prior to that, going all the way back to the beginning of bass and bass fishing out of bass boats, because it was not that long ago that there was no spot lock. There was no, I mean, no integrated systems that run your whole boat, like the sea monster stuff that's going on. Yeah. Lithium batteries, forward-facing sonar. You're talking about a lot of quote unquote major advancements in, in technologies that mm -hmm. we talk about and then it's on to the next one. Were, was that happening in all those other five year chunks mm -hmm. or is this just like a rocket ship in the past four to five years? No, I think it, it is technology taking over very, very, very quickly compared to other times in the industry. There are phases. Uh, I don't even think you were around when you went from the flasher to the paper graph. Was it paper graph to flasher or flasher to paper graph? I think it was flasher, the original flasher to paper graph. Because when I got in the industry 2008, the first big thing was side imaging and down imaging. Yeah. I mean, it was... And that's a long time ago, You get man. in the boat and look at one of the guy's deals and you're like, oh yeah. my gosh. It was neat to go over to some of these guys that had fished Grand Lake forever and they would just have stacks and stacks and stacks of those paper graphs. Right. It seems... How long does it take for something to catch on? So you remember the power poles came out. Was Rojas like the, one of the first ones to have a power yeah. pole? Yeah. And, and everybody you, had one. But listen, do you not remember for a couple years when we were shooting photographs of the Elite Series? And this was a number of years. Unless you were in Florida, where all the flats boats, because it was originally marketed for the flats and, and all that, you could find an Elite Series Pro from a distance based on their power poles. Mm -hmm. Power pole or power poles. Elite Series Pro, go shoot their photo. Now you literally can't find a boat without power poles. Yeah. But it seemed like it went from zero to some of them adopted it with one to then pretty much everybody had one to, oh, look at these guys taking it over the top with two to then everybody had two, but it was a three or four year process. It seems like guys are adapting quicker now or not. What is your opinion <laughs> on that? I think the market is adapting quicker. In other words, these companies are providing these products at a level that they've never done before, mainly because of what the consumer is telling them, hey, I want this on my boat. So now the companies are responding and have been responding and throwing it out there. The other thing is, come on, man, it's like anybody else and any other thing. They want to be just like those guys that are out there on tour. No, I'm talking about the guys on tour. I'm talking about well, the top looking, level of adopting here, this the This is what technology. they're looking for. They're looking for any kind of edge that they can find with whatever equipment is legal. That's what I'm saying. But it seems like as of recently, guys are realizing where the edge is a lot quicker than they did in the past. Well, you didn't have options in the past. Yeah, you did. They just weren't our current options. Here, here, you had power poles. You had side imaging. You, you had down imaging. You didn't have the availability of the technology and the availability to do research on the technology. It wasn't there. You know, you talked about when you got into this whole thing, side images was a big, was a big deal. Well, dude, back in the 70s, 80s, and early 90s, 
None of this existed because the web didn't exist. Yeah. All right, let's face it. So many of the young anglers out there, including yourself, are relying on technology. We've had this discussion. It's not just electronics. It's the amount of time and effort that you put into on this thing right here and the drive to find an edge. Not only could we not catch any fish, we then could not find our way back to the ramp. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's it, dude. You guys are out there trying to find any edge that you can to be successful and win. That's it. Now, those guys back in the 80s and the 70s and the 90s, they were doing the same thing. They were just going about it a totally different way because of the availability of what little information that they had. I mean, think about it, man. A long, long, long time ago, the first guy that figured out, hey, I can go up this river and I can put three gas cans there and I can go, you know, 60 more miles up the river and nobody's even thought about that. I was thinking I have to turn eight things on to go fishing. Could you imagine <laughs> in the 80s pulling up next to Harold Allen at the boat ramp and saying, hold on, let me get my boat ready. What's he going to do? He's going to unstrap it, yeah. take the motor toter off, hit one power button, and he's done. And get after it. I've got power pull buttons, master yeah. power switch, power at the console, unit at the console, two units up front, trolling motor. I mean, there, it, I'm just like, beep, 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 beep. Okay, yeah. now we could go. It's just, it's just it's amazing. You know, Dave on the instant feedback makes a point. It says live, live coverage has made things harder to keep a secret or keep it on the down low mm -hmm. with so much stuff. That's why the effort that is in, that is taking place behind the scenes is really at the peak that it's ever been before. But, but does lack of secret... So, yeah, you might be sacrificing some tournament earnings, but is that not made up for in your sales and value to that company by exposing that secret and being sponsored by that company and making it up in the sponsor? Yeah, when it comes to equipment, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, as opposed to, hey, I'm going to keep this a secret because I may make a couple more $5,000 checks off of it. Yeah, yeah. I don't know, man. It's a conversation that's going to continue to take place. Uh, this whole technology situation... You know, should they and use it? Was, it? Should it they was, not? And that's a great, great point by Steven on the instant feedback. It was massively amplified this fall because of the COVID schedules yeah. where you were dealing with suspended bait fish related fish on the Coosa River down south on fisheries that typically would have been power fishing, flipping grass fishing, that it would have been talked about minimally it became the massive player because that is the time of the year where it shines to catch the toughest fish under the toughest conditions. Yeah. And you're probably not going to hear about that as much in February, March, April, spawning tournaments, shallow tournaments, cover tournaments, backwater tournaments. Now you'll be talking about, oh, I found this two foot ditch because of the mapping and the relief shading and the, all of that stuff yeah. and the Google earth and all that. And the forward-facing sonar takes a little bit of a backseat until we get up north, and now all of a sudden it's, oh, how do you, you, know, how do you catch a fish without <laughs> it? I'm just saying this year was massively magnified because of the open schedule, the tour schedule, and the Elite Series schedule. Yeah. Went to really tough fisheries at really tough times with suspended fish around bait. Yeah. That it highlighted the efficiency of forward-facing sonar. No, I agree. All right, uh, one thing real quick. I know I, I got a couple of emails, and there were some YouTube comments out there that I was on the Randy Block at Kool-Aid bandwagon. Look, folks, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you this right now. All right, it is a necessity to be able to take advantage of, of the tools that are available. All right, the point that I was trying to make was I believe at the highest level that you should not ban electronics. But what you should do is you should put some type of limitation. That's all I said. All right? And Randy's kind of had a, a different turn and in a different aspect when he looks at how important the ele electronics are when it comes to tournament fishing. At the highest level, you don't have golf pros out there with 30 clubs in the back. 
Do you? No. No. Okay. Uh, you, you you don't have guys with tennis rackets on the tennis tour bringing in thirty tennis rackets. They may have six or seven. They have quite a few, but. You know, there's different tension. Anyway, I don't want to get into that. There are limitations on the number of bowling All you're balls saying that is you can have If they tour. wanted to, they could hit the ball a lot further. Yeah. They have the capability to hit the ball further. They have the capability to spin it more on the tennis court. They have the capability. They have the capabilities, and the governing organizations have said, okay, this is where we're going to draw the line on this. Now, you can play within these parameters, and you can have all the illegal stuff, yeah. but when it comes to PGA Tour competition, this is a 400cc head. This is the ball, and this is what we're sticking with, and you guys are maxed out. Yeah. That's what you're saying. That's all I'm saying, all right? You can't use aluminum bats in the major league mm -hmm. or metal composite bats or whatever you want to say, all right? Can you use active target or live scope in professional tournaments? Yes. But put a limitation on it, some kind of limitation. People have well, said you could only look fifty feet no, out. No, no, no. Listen, people have said number of screens, number of inches, number of uh, uh, dollar amount, retail dollar amount you can max out at. There are ways of creating limitations to where the use of electronics is still present. They do that in MLF. They do right. that in the cups when everybody hops in the boats that have the exact same electronics, the exact same trolling motors. Yeah, but. It's one brand, one one deal. All I know, that. but I'm just I, saying they I'm do saying, it. Dude. They do it. I Everyone can't imagine, has the exact equal stuff. But that's not what I'm saying. All right? That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying is if the limit is ten grand, then okay, you have a limit of $10,000 retail value in equipment. Go put whatever you want well, to if on you, it. No, you couldn't do a dollar amount. You'd have to do an inches amount. Why could you not do a dollar amount? Put Why? Because it's going to be different for every brand. They're all about the same, dude. It's going to be different for every brand. But then, then you're, choose. You can choose then. I'm just I don't saying, know what the right dollar it's amount inches, is. It's inches. Inches. It should be 20 inches or whatever. Whatever the number. That's what I'm talking about. 30 inches of graph. Yeah. Max yeah. amount of thrust. Is there anything wrong with that, Matt? Inches and thrust. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, is there anything wrong with that? Putting a limitation on the highest level of competition in the game. It does not seem to have withheld the progression of golf. Yeah. I I don't think it would withhold the progression of fishing. I mean, guys would still push the limits, and guys would still work within the parameters of the rules. Yeah. Yeah, we'll see. Good stuff, though, man. And hopefully everybody will check out all the content that's out there on YouTube uh, pertaining to the new active target going to be available uh, full force in January. I'm sure there's a, a few retail outlets, distributors mm -hmm. that will be able to have it uh, in the latter half of this month. But Bassmaster used is. to do it. You used to get in one of their wrapped boats, and they all had the same electronics and the same stuff. And then, but they broke down. That was one of the biggest deals. FLW yeah. used to do it. One of the biggest deals on the Elite Series. No, you're right. Was when the anglers lobbied and lobbied and lobbied and said, "Let us use our own stuff." Fishing's a, li a little. I don't know. I don't know. I mean, you, you, the way I look at it is Phil Mickelson's wedges are kind of like Jacob Wheeler's graphs. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like everyone could have Phil Mickelson wedges, but he makes his living on his wedges. Yeah. Yeah. I get it, man. But he's still working within the same parameters. But he doesn't have 13 wedges in his bag. He could if he wanted to. And not have any other club. 100%. <laughs> He's not going to win too many times. I'm just saying. It, not going to win. Do That's I see silly, the point dude. that you're making? Yes. Yeah. 100%. All right. It's all good. All right, folks. Uh, tomorrow, John Acosta, we will talk about all the developments recently here for Major League Fishing and the BPT with John. And then uh, one show next week, we have a big announcement on next Wednesday. We'll have a special guest. And uh, wrap 20. 20 up. You know, I did not see this happening when uh, we wrapped up our show. Is that in not interesting? We can now see in detail 50 feet in front of the boat, but we still can't use an Alabama rig? We talked about that while you were gone. Yeah. 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 I mean, we can get into that discussion too. Jeez. So, what'd you win for second? People are wanting to know. 750. So, how much was the grill worth? 
I was a high end grill. It would have done I, I some guess. fantastic searing. We went seven fifty each. Fifteen hundred bucks between yeah. you and Dave. Yeah. Huh. Dave caught the Good big job, one. He man. caught a five thirty five. Kentucky. I kind of felt. Was it a spot? No, it was a large mouth. Huh. I kind of felt bad because he had my cheap spinning reel. I am so spinning reel poor. I've got one that back reels, one that works good, and then one of them's like a $30 spinning reel <laughs> that either pulls drag or doesn't pull drag. Like, there is no fine line. And I'm yelling at him, loosen the drag, loosen the drag. And he's got the rod buried, and he's like, I know how to fight a fish. And I'm trying to reach over and loosen it, and then the drag takes off, and then he can't reel, and he's like, get away from my reel. And I'm like, wow, he gets fighting. in and he's like, dude, I know how to fight a fish. And I was like, <laughs> he's like, your re- your drag wasn't working. And I was like, well, yeah, it's understandable. So I'm a little real poor right now. Yeah. Oh, he was using your stuff? All my stuff, yeah, because he flew in. Yeah. Yeah. All it's right. great reel. It's just it either is pulling drag or it isn't. It's kind of a I fine line there. There isn't a smooth, buttery drag system on that reel because it was an extra reel. It's more like buttermilk <laughs> it was like curds yeah <laughs> chunky buttermilk it was not that's disgusting yeah. all right everybody be safe out there stay warm uh hopefully tomorrow matt will make it back in studio hopefully the blizzard doesn't hold him back if not he will be remote from tulsa uh and as i mentioned john acosta tomorrow all right everybody stay warm be safe that's it we're out of here